Jeffrey with another edition of Stock Smart, the February 2nd, 2021 edition, and happy Groundhog Day to Punxsutawney Phil. I wanted to go and start with the fundamental purposes of a short seller. So there's so many shorts going on. If you're paying attention today, you're seeing GameStop do what it was supposed to do. It was going to fall. And anybody who was in it, unfortunately, if they got in at 300 or 400, you know, I feel bad for you because you've lost a lot of money. It's now down to 128. I would guess that that stock is going to go down to 10 again. And w- one of the reasons right now is who knows if the red edit, they made their money. Maybe they're not going to get involved in it again. Maybe they feel like they got lucky. They wanted to get out. And now who knows if they're going to take this on again. But GameStop is uh, getting decimated today and, and going down. But I wanted to get into the fundamental kind of purpose of a short seller. The short seller is there. And, and what a short seller really can do in the market is essentially if they're, if they're really doing their work, they're researching companies. And over the years, you would rely on short sellers to, to say, hey, these, this accounting doesn't look correct. So I'll give you an example like Enron. Um, when Enron was found out about, or if you look at the stock chart of Enron, it was just like any technical analyst would have gotten out way before it hit the bottom. But Enron was essentially, when, when that whole Enron thing happened, Enron was booking out future sales on their books years in advance and, and accounting that as income. And there were people there were noti- people who noticed that and started building short positions and people were paying attention to it, got on the short side of that trade, and they were, they were trying to get the information out that, that Enron's accounting practices were, in, were improper. And so the real fundamental purpose of a short seller is to look at these companies and to, and, to, and to figure out which ones are fraudulent, which ones are, as the movie Wall Street would say, cooking the books, you know, and which ones are, 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 are real. There's also, there was a company called, um, it, it's a great series if you've ever seen it on, on uh, Netflix uh, called Dirty Money. And there's, a, there's an episode or a seri- uh, an episode on a company called Valiant. There was a, a researcher who was working for a short seller who essentially figured out that Valiant was only spending, uh, you know, they looked at the balance sheet and they were seeing that Valiant only spent something like under 10% on research and de- development. Now, Valiant was a biotech company. Biotech companies spend most of their expenses on research and development in scientists, in, in projects, and in bringing in and doing research studies. So research and development is, is a massive expense for a biotech firm, usually 35 40%, if not more. And what they noticed, the, the researcher for the short seller noticed was that Valiant wasn't spending any money, or they were spending very little, under 10%, I believe, on research and development. And that stood out like a sore thumb for, for a company that was producing all these, you know, these biopharma drugs. And in the end, Bio, uh, Valiant fell mightily, and, um, and the stock went down the tubes. And the, if you watch the series, and you should, it was really interesting how dedicated the, the researcher was to the, to, the, um, to the research on the project really revealing stuff and doing digging like through garbage cans essentially to find any information she could get her hands on. There are there are firms though where you're gonna see and this is where it's the wrong way to do it. You'll see firms where they take a position on a stock and maybe the stock is just gone a certain way uh, parabolic because people get behind it. There become it becomes a momentum stock sort of like Jumaya was I think last year. And then there was essentially a hit piece done on Jumaya which is uh, spelled the uh, ticker symbol is JMIA. There was a hit piece done on the on the stock, which essentially freaked out investors, and the stock went down. Uh, it, I think it was at forty. It went down to like twelve. So, and if you read the hit piece, which I did read it, it was really just commoditized information. It was generalizations without anything really backing it. It was things like the company uh, Jumaya, if you know it, it's sort of trying to become its the Amazon of Africa. And the commoditized information was, were things like, oh, well, you know, Africa is still, you know, as a nation, as a country, it's still developing its currency and may not have ways to pay. People may not have addresses delivered packages to. I mean, it's, there were, it was a really simple kind of generalizations like that in the report. But nonetheless, the, the person who put out the report certainly had a short position in the stock and benefited greatly which is, you know, that's stock manipulation, if you will. So that's really what goes on, you know, with, with short selling. And there is a real purpose for it. And it's to try to find these companies that are doing fraud. But of course, like anything else, it's being abused by other companies who are looking to make money off manipulating the market.
So let's take a look at a stock that I'm um, paying attention to these days, and it's called Futu. It's F-U-T-U. So F-U-T-U, Futu. It's been going ballistic. It's parabolic right now. Um, up again, $13 or 12% today at 118 Futu, uh, if you have the stomach for it, is a Chinese company. So you'll be buying an ADR, an American Depository Receipt. And essentially what they are is they're a broker and a wealth manager. So they've had a growth of clients. They're up about 137% year over year. Their earnings also increased by 270%. And what's gone, what, what's happened with this company is there's been a large uh, boom of IPOs in China. So, and Futu as a broker has managed the IPOs. So they're greatly benefiting from the surge in IPOs. There were something like 35 companies that went uh, public in the last year in China and Futu handled a good majority of them. There's one other company called Tiger who handles IPOs in China, but Futu is handling a large majority. So they're getting a lot of growth from that. So that's one reason that, that their stock is really going up. And another reason it's kind of interesting is, is the stock was held kind of in, um, it had done well, but was held kind of in a channel, if you will, uh, in the 35 to 40 range or 30 to 40 range up until about January. And then we see since January, it's really taking off. One of the reasons is Trump has been really aggressive with China you know, delisting stocks, talking about things like that. And that, that really scares these Chinese stocks. I mean, when Alibaba was under attack from Trump and they were talking about Tencent, Alibaba and other Chinese companies potentially uh, being delisted, those sent those stock prices down massively. So now with the new administration, this stock has gained some, you know, maybe clarity or maybe we don't know yet what the position of Biden's presidency is going to look like in terms of China. So you'll see this stock has jumped massively, something like 300% since January. Right now, still in a parabolic, like technical read, you would just be, you'd be all in because it has no, right now it's just to the sky. It hasn't shown any kind of break mark at all. It hasn't, it's, it, it is gonna have a problem with um, support when it does fall because it's got a long way to go down to get support. But right now with this administration change, very interesting, to see what happens here. Um, and that's why the stock has, has really taken off, I believe. So I have a question here from- the average uh, investor. Thank you for sending the questions. We are growing in popularity. The podcast is now on Spotify, Apple, Amazon, Google, on YouTube as well. And we're, I'm getting several questions, uh, 25 to 30 questions a day. And keep them coming. I'll try to get to as many as I can. But this question is from Robert, and, and it's really interesting because I, I don't know if people know this, and it's how does Robin Hood make money? It's kind of like if you've seen that movie, The Big Short, there's a scene where one trader's talking to another, to a broker, and he's saying, well, how are you going to F me? Meaning, how are you going to screw me over? How do you make money? And I think people go into Robin Hood, and they're like, hey, I don't know. I mean, it's free to me, and, and I'm making money. Well, Robin Hood has to make money, right, to stay in business. And 40 to 50% of their income comes from how they process or payment order flow. So what essentially happens is Robinhood, you make the trade on Robinhood, and then Robinhood passes that trade through to a broker. Now the broker has the stock usually in its inventory, or they go out and get more of it. And essentially the broker then charges a markup, a higher price to Robinhood to execute the trade. And then Robinhood shares in what they call like a rebate, where Robinhood gets paid by the broker for executing the transaction and they get that money back. And that's 40% of their income. So when you make a trade on Robinhood and you buy a stock, say it's a dollar one oh one, the broker may have had that sitting in its, you know, inventory at 98 cents. Robinhood gets maybe a penny off every share or less fractions of or thereof. But when you're doing billions of transactions, you can see how that can add up. But that's essentially how they get paid. They're getting paid from the payment of order flows, which is essentially how they process out their transactions to the broker dealer. And so the broker dealer then benefits. Now it begs the question with Robinhood doing so many trades right now, there's a company that processes a lot of their, of their trades. It's called, it's called Citadel. I've had, I've heard conversations. I've read reports about this. It's very um, beneficial for Citadel to be handling those amount of, that amount of trades. As you can see, they're seeing essentially in a private pool of transactions, what's moving and they're seeing it before other people. So Citadel essentially uh, being a market maker can influence or will have information maybe potentially that other people don't have. 
So I did see Kyle Bass today on CNBC. Kyle Bass um, also runs his own fund. And he was talking about how, you know, maybe the SEC needs to look at those transactions and how those processors or the ones who are handing the, the order flows, like the broker, how they maybe should be reviewed because of what information they have. It's a very interesting question when you really think about the way this is processed. So I want to sign off for today. Thank you for keep the questions coming. Really appreciate it. If you're on YouTube, likes, we love them. If you want to reach me, it's Jeffrey at JeffreyCamus.com. Have a great day. Bye.